Talk Radio. He has, yes, he has. Oh, he has, yes, he has. Amen. Well, I praise good from a good praise God from a good friend, Mark Wheeler. He's such a blessing and such a talented songwriter. I praise God he let me cross paths with Brother Mark. <clears throat> All right. I want to take our Bible this morning. We're going to turn to Luke, the ninth chapter. Luke, chapter 9. And I want to welcome in all those that are listening to us this morning on Blog Talk Radio all over the country, all over the world. We have a, a large number of listeners, and we are grateful for them and uh, many in the Philippines, many in the, uh, I would say the, uh, what is the area I'm trying to say, the Caribbean. Uh, we have them in the Caribbean countries. We have them in uh, Central America, South America, uh, in England, Europe, and uh, even over into India and Pakistan and places like that where this little old ministry here in this little old town in Texas is reaching all over the world. And it's not that I pursued it. I just put it out there. And the Bible says, you know, to cast your bread upon the waters and it'll return after many days. And I believe that that's referring to when we, we put the gospel out, we don't know how far it's going to go. We don't know where it's going to reach to. But you know what? After many days, I believe that's when we get there to heaven and we stand before Jesus and we find out just where all it went and just where all it landed. And I just praise God for the, for the blessing that he's given me to, to, uh, to spread the gospel. Luke chapter 9 in verse 51 through 56 is actually what we're going to focus on this morning. That's just the that's the, the uh, central text there, but we're going to go a few other places after that. And uh, for those who may be tuning in their very first Sunday, I, I, you're kind of getting in on the middle of something because um, this is part 86. <laughs> we're in part 86 this morning, sister, of a message that started... Uh, back, oh, uh, well, 86 weeks ago. And um, it, the title of the series is Getting to Know Jesus. And my, my, my initial opening statement with this was you can, you can be around somebody, you can listen to them a little bit, you can <clears throat> see them two or three times a week, but you don't really know that person. You, you have a superficial uh, relationship. If you really want to know, know, know a person, you got to live with them. you got to spend time with them every day. got to see them at their best. you got to see them at their worst. you got to know everything. You, I mean, you got to know them inside and out to really know them, to know what somebody's about and what somebody will do. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say they know Jesus, but they don't spend time with him every day. And if you don't spend time with him, you don't know him. And that's what we're doing. We want to spend time with him. We want to... Uh, you know, he said, take my yoke upon you. And that's the verse where all this started from. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Get to know me. And there's no one else that we ought to know any better than the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so let's look this morning at our scripture, Luke chapter 9, okay? Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 56. The Bible says, and it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as it though he would go through Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? even as Elijah did. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your throne this morning. And Lord, we come as, as simple as we know how, Lord. We come believing, we come expecting. And Lord, we come in need. Father, we need you. We need a fresh touch from heaven we need the Holy Ghost of God to come and settle in with us and open our understanding and, 
and, and guide us through the scriptures and guide our listening, guide our understanding. Lord, take our minds from all the little little tiny distractions that would, would so innocently take our, our attention away from what you're trying to say to us. Lord God, zero us in on, on, on what the message that the Holy Spirit tries to convey to us this morning through the preaching of the Word of God. And Lord, we give you all the glory. We want to magnify Jesus. We want to, we want to see and listen and, and, and understand. Lord, give us ears to hear, as Jesus cried out so many times, that he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Lord, let us hear today. And Father, I pray for each and every one who's listening to us here in the room and Lord, around the world. We pray, Lord, that the sinner nearest hell gets saved today. Lord, we pray for the backslidden soul to come home. Lord, we pray for you to patch up broken marriages. We pray for you to return wayward children. Lord, bring daddies home. Bring mamas home. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would, Lord, you do a work in some lives today. Lord, turn people away from the, from the, the cup of this world that they've been drinking from. Lord God, allow them to come and see that it wasn't nothing but slop they were eating. Lord, bring them home. Father, I just praise you today. And Lord, I pray for the preachers out there this morning that are preaching the gospel. I pray you'd empower them, give them, give them power from on high, unction to preach. And Lord, give the people that are listening ears to hear. Father, I just, I just plead with you, Lord, to give us, give us the ability to see past what we've always done and see that maybe we've done it wrong. Lord, if it's not lined up with you, please help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, I want to kind of, I'm trying to remember what where I was at last week. I, I'm pretty sure I was in John, but I'm trying to remember. Y'all remember? <laughs> let me, I tell you what, let me look real quick. I, I want to look and see. The scripture I was reading, I, I, I jumped back and forth from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John so often. We're working through a harmony of the Gospels in this. And so uh, it's easy for me to get confused on this. Give me just a second. We'll get it straightened out. Um, it was in John, John chapter 7. If you want to turn over real quickly, just so we have context, John chapter 7. Last week's message was titled Rejection. <clears throat> and... We looked back in chapter 6, and we saw where, where uh, Jesus was preaching on himself as the bread of life, and, they, and uh, you know, he had such a, a crowd following him at that time. And, and when he began to tell them, you know, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And what he was simply, he wasn't saying, come over here and be accountable and consume me. He was saying, but you have to have me in you or you can't do anything. I, he, I'm the bread. I'm, I'm what you need to be sustained. He's, he's the light of the world. They're in darkness without him. He's saying, you've got to have me. And they were like, no, that's too hard. I, don't want, I, I, I can't live with that. And I walk, they walked away. And, uh, you know, and he turned to his own disciples, and he said, will you also go away? And what John say, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and then Jesus uh, in chapter 7, where we were at last week, you know, his, the, the Feast of Tabernacles had come. We're in September of the year. Uh, Jesus' brothers, his half-brothers, uh, they were getting ready to go down to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles. All the Jewish males had to attend this feast. And, 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 and so they, and, and by the way, they, weren't, they were not believers at this time. They did not believe he was the Son of God. They did not believe he was the Messiah. They just, they thought, he, this is my kooky brother, he goes out and teaches. And he's got all these people following him around. They, they literally did not believe he was who he said he was at that time. And, and they influenced, like I said last week, they even influenced their mother at times. Because she would go out with them and say, you know, Jesus, come out. This is crazy. All these people, y'all come, come back with us. And, and uh, so, so Jesus, at this time, he told him, he said, you know, it's not my time to go down to Jerusalem. Because he knew that once he went down to Jerusalem, a series of events would be set in motion that would lead to his crucifixion. And everything, like we said last week, it's something we all have to remember. Everything works on God's timetable, not ours. God, God doesn't. When we snap, God doesn't jump. God's not spiritual Santa Claus who just does everything we want him to do. God is God, and we are his people. And even though he's there for us, and even though he says he wants to give us the desires of our heart, the simple fact of it is it's going to happen when he wants it to, not when we want it to. And we have to line up with his schedule. So anyway, Jesus... Uh, 
Jesus uh, is getting ready to head down to this feast in Jerusalem. And again, he's been in Galilee all this time. He's going down to Jerusalem where he knows, again, he knows that when he gets there, the series of events are going to take place. And it'll be about six months' time that we're going to cover from here to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we're going to go back to, to Luke chapter 9. And we find ourselves, even though we're in a different gospel, we find ourselves at the moment when he's getting ready to leave and go to Jerusalem. Okay? He's going to go down to the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Bible says, now listen, it says, And it came to pass that when the time was come that he should be received up, that means when he, the time's come that he's going down there, and now, again, all these things are going to happen. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In other words, he intently made up his mind, now's the time that I'm going down there. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. So again, let's remember, um, I know this doesn't look like Israel, but we're going to use this door again. Up here is the Sea of Galilee, okay? And Capernaum over here to the, to the uh, west of the Sea of Galilee, the northwest corner. And that's where his home base was. But down here is the Dead Sea at the bottom and Jerusalem off to the left. And in between is Samaria. Samaria, again, a bunch of half-Jews, and they hated the Jews. There was prejudice there. And they believed that they were to worship in a mountain there instead of in Jerusalem. There was a lot of hostility and hatred. But in order for him to go to Jerusalem, he's going to have to go through Samaria. In other words, unless he's going to go way over to the coast and go all the way around the region of Samaria. And he's not going to do that. He's going through there. So he's sending out, uh, he's sending out messengers to, say, to go to that city and say, listen, the master's coming and we need a place to stay. The master's coming. We need, we need something to eat. We'll pay for it. Gladly pay for it. But we want to make preparations so when he gets there, we don't have to figure everything out. I mean, that makes sense. Nowadays, we call ahead and we book it online. But, I mean, they, were, they had to send people to do it. So, so anyway, <clears throat> so they came down there, and they did not receive him. The Samaritans said, no. Are you all listening? Are you listening to what I'm saying? When they got down there, the Samaritans said, no, we don't want him here. Now, folks, we got us just an old-fashioned case, case of prejudice here. I mean, that's all this is, is prejudice. Why? Because they're Jews. They don't worship like we worship, and they're not, they're not what we are, so we don't, want them, we don't want them to have anything to do with us, okay? And the Bible says, And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. That's another reason. They didn't want him because of where he was going. You going down there with all them people to that, that place for those reasons? No, you're not coming through here. But let's remember something, folks. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. He is going through here one last time. This is the last time he's ever going to pass this way. Now hear me. I can draw from that. I can tell you this. If the Lord Jesus Christ is knocking at your heart's door, it may be the last time he's ever going to pass that way. And they said, no, we don't want him. We don't want him. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? Now, what in the world is he talking about? Take your Bible. Turn to Second Kings. Second Kings, over in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, First, Second Chronicles. Oh, wait, wait. Let me get that right. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First, Second Kings. Pays off to, order, to memorize them things in order. Second Kings chapter one verse one. Second Kings one, you got it. All right. The Bible says then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab and Ahaziah. Ahaziah I'm gonna get that right. Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria 
and was sick. Now, this is the king of Samaria. He fell. I don't know what all was going on, but there was, but but he fell down through, through the lattice in his upper chamber. So he was upstairs and he fell. And the Bible says he was sick. Well, he was injured. He was hurt. Bad shape. He fell a long way. And he sent messengers and said unto them, now get this, go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Do you know who Beelzebub is? That's the god that represents, the little g god that represents Satan, the lord of the flies. That's who Beelzebub, god of Ekron, is. So he says, go down there and ask the devil if I'm going to live or not. But the angel of the Lord, you know who that is? That's Jesus in the Old Testament. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in heaven, or God in Israel rather, that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? And they said unto him, There came up a man to meet us, and said unto us, Go turn again to the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, It is not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baals above the God of Ekron. Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, Ah, it's Elijah the Tishbite. He knew who he was. Then the king, listen, the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. So here goes this captain out marching. He's got his 50 soldiers with him, the Samaritan soldiers. They're going to go out and get Elijah. And behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of the 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Boom! Fire fell and they were ashes. You know, Elijah's pretty good at this fire calling down business. Amen? You don't want to cross Elijah. God has given him something. And again, verse 11, he also sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. Get down here, boy. That's what he's saying to him. And Elijah answered and said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and my 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. A hundred dead men. No, a hundred and two, actually. 102 dead men right there at the bottom of that hill. And he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. And guess what happened? He got to the bottom of the hill and started wading through the ashes of 102 dead soldiers. Walking through their ashes. And the Bible says, and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burn up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him under the king, and he went and told the king the same thing, you're going to die, and the king died. Okay? Plain and simple. But that's the event that James, uh, that James and John are referring to here in Luke chapter 9 when they're saying to Jesus, say, hey, Jesus, they don't want you here. Why don't we just turn this place into a parking lot? 
You ever heard anybody say that? I've heard Christian people say that about Iraq. They ought to drop a nuclear bomb over and turn that place into a parking lot. You ever heard anybody talk like that? I have. Turn it into a sheet of glass with a nuclear bomb. Well, that's human emotion. That's all that is. That's your flesh saying, you know what? They don't want our American way of life. They don't want, hey, they don't like us. Well, let's just kill every one of them. That's the kind of language that you get out of a lot of patriotic people. Now, I'm not against patriotic people, but I want to say something to you this morning. I am for Jesus way more than I am for people who are patriotic. And I don't stutter when I say that. I am for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he said above and beyond what anybody else thinks, period, including my mother, including my wife, including my children, including my friends, including anybody and everybody who would give me advice that goes contrary to what the Lord Jesus Christ has said. I I will take his advice over yours any day of the week, and I would also inspect in turn for you to take his advice over mine. So Jesus is on his way down there, and, he, and he's planning to stop and see him, and, you know, and this happens, and, and James and John, man, they get furious. They want something done. But there's prejudice here, you see? There's so much prejudice going on. Why do these people hate him? They just do, but they, they really do. If you look over in John chapter 4, you see the story of Jesus and Sychar as well. Go ahead and turn over and look at this. Look at that for just a second. John chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible said, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, about six o'clock in the evening. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then the woman of the Samaria said unto him, Now listen to what she said to him. How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. How dare you ask me to get you a drink? We don't have nothing to do with y'all. I mean, that's the attitude she had. Listen, it, racism is not right no matter where you live, but let me tell you something. Racism has always existed and will always exist. It is not something that you can put down with parades and marches and banners and signs. It's not something you can do by wagging your finger at somebody. It is going to exist because we are fallen creatures that, that think we're better than somebody else. I'm telling you, that's human nature. I'm not condoning it. I'm simply stating the fact as long as human beings walk around uh, with, with, with souls shrouded in a body of flesh that is tainted with sin, there will be racism in the world. You can't get rid of it. And it got under James and John's skin. These are preachers of the gospel who walk side by side daily with the Lord Jesus Christ These are men who have noble intentions. They've left everything to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's don't take nothing away from these men. They have left their fishing boats. They left their dad. They left family. They left friends. They're walking with Christ. They're doing what Christ wants them to do. They have gone further and done more than they ever dreamed they would ever do in their life. And they're walking along with him, and they're thinking to themselves, what a privilege I have. I'm walking with the King of kings and the Lord of lords and we're going to Jerusalem to that feast, how dare they not want us? They ought to just, we ought to just call down fire from heaven and destroy them. Somebody might step back and go, praise God, somebody stood up. Praise God, somebody got enough of it. That's your flesh. Somebody might say, now hold on a minute, preacher. Ain't there a such thing as righteous indignation? I dare say there is a such thing as righteous indignation. But that is not what was needed here. I'm going to tell you something. This this is a message 
that's, that's really for today. It really is more than we realize. Turn to Romans chapter 12. I'm going somewhere with this. I know it seems like I may be running rabbit trails. I'm really going somewhere with this. Romans chapter 12. In verse 17 through 21. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Again, James and John, they're hot on the collar. They don't, uh, listen, they're ready, to, they're ready to kill everybody in this town because they don't want Jesus. They're ready to kill them. What Paul said in Romans 12, 17 through 21, recompense or pay back to no man evil for evil. Well, they treated us wrong, Jesus. Let's get them. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. What are we on our way to do? We're on our way to complete something for the Lord. We're on our way to do something for uh, this is that God has ordained. On the way, we shouldn't do something evil. That's not who we are. We're not walking. I mean, can you think of all the times when Jesus called down fire from heaven and burned everybody to crisp? I mean, can you count it on one hand? I don't think there is a time, is there? I can't recall a time when Jesus opened up the earth and swallowed people up in the New Testament, can you? Nor when Jesus called down plagues to fall upon everybody. Wait a minute. Er, let's hold a record. Let's go back a little bit. What I have seen him do, I have seen him open blind eyes. I have seen him unstop a tongue that wouldn't talk. I have seen him raise the dead. I have seen him cast out devils. I have seen him uh, heal heal multiple people that possess the devils. And nowhere... And, and people that were hit, were were, were uh, infested with leprosy. I mean, they, they, their, their lives was a mess. I mean, he's done all of that, yet I've never seen him destroy one thing. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Everywhere he went, he went about doing good, the Bible says. And then verse 18, the Bible says, if it be possible. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I have to be honest with you. If I had preached on this ten years ago, I wouldn't have the same approach I have this morning. God has changed the way, the way I've looked at things, the way I've thought about things over the course of the years. I, I used to be more who I'm preaching against than who I am today. But God has, you, you grow as you get to know Jesus, as you learn of him, you find out that's not who he is, so that's not who I should be. It's easy, it's easy to, conv hear me, it's easy to convince yourself that your emotions to do wrong to someone who is doing wrong to the kingdom of God is noble. It's easy for us in our mind to begin to think that we're doing noble work by becoming vigilantes for God's sake. And I know that must be true because I have Facebook and I, and I get attacked by preachers constantly. <laughs> I do. By men who, are supposed, who claim to love the Lord and all they want to do is tear the brethren apart all day long because they would disagree on some little ticky-tack thing that don't matter anyway. I'm telling you right now, folks, we're living in a day and time where everybody gets offended at everything. The Bible says as much as it be possible, as much as life in you, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all the brethren. No, it doesn't say that. Live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with the corrupt. Live peaceably with the drunks. Live peaceably with the abortionists. Live peaceably with sodomites. Live peaceably with those who would, who, would, who would destroy our country. Live peaceably with those who want to turn it into a communist country. Live peaceably. It's hard to live. You say, how do I live peaceably with all these people who are attacking the very fiber of what we stand for in America? How do I live, how do I live peaceably with those who are against the things that my God teaches are wrong? How do I... How do, I mean, they, they're for the things that God teaches wrong. How do I do that? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves. 
It's not your fight. But rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So that goes against our flesh, folks. That goes against our feelings. Our feelings, our feelings, listen to me, they are from your flesh. Your flesh is not saved. Your flesh has never been saved, and your flesh will never be saved. Your flesh holds your feelings. They're natural. They are, they are in every human being, but they are not governed by your spirit unless you put them under the control of your spirit. Most people, most people let their emotions or feelings control them more than they let the Spirit of God guide them. We live in a feelings-driven generation, a feelings-driven world. I mean... All one has to do today is turn on the television set and they watch a bunch of political pundits argue their feelings all day long. That's all they do on TV anymore is argue feelings, not facts, but feelings. And I'm thankful for feelings. I'm thankful God gave us feelings. They are God-given, but you know what? They, when they run contrary to God's word, the feelings got to get out of the way. So what does God say we're supposed to do? He's, God says, get out the way and let me handle it. You see, when we take anything into our hands, we're going to handle it. You know what? Somebody done me wrong. You know what? I was doing right, and they done me wrong, so I've got to do something to settle this thing. And we set out to, to set the record straight, get it settled, get things evened out, and we're going to do something to show them. Well, we're no different than they are. God says, stop. No. Get out of the way. I'm going to handle this for you. God knows how to handle it the right way. What was James and John wanting to do? Kill them dead. Get rid of them. They don't have a reason to exist anymore. What does Jesus say? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. That's what he says. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirst, give him a drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that's what the Bible says. <coughs> that goes against our thinking. We have got to come to the point to where we say to the Lord Jesus Christ, my thinking is messed up, Lord. My thinking leads me to do things that I shouldn't do sometimes, Lord. And when those urges come upon me to do things that I know I shouldn't do, to stand up for myself, to retaliate against somebody doing me wrong or doing someone I love wrong, even if it's a child who's been done wrong, a spouse who's been done wrong, parent who's been done wrong, it's not my job to attack somebody else. It's my job as a Christian to go to my Heavenly Father and say, Father, this is taking place, and I want you to avenge this problem. And it's my job then to go and be Christ-like to that person. It's not easy to do, folks. I'm not going to tell you that I'm an expert at it because I'm not an expert, but I want to be. I have a desire to be because my Lord would have me to be. Let's, let's just look for a second. Turn to James chapter 3. Turn to James chapter 3. So, again, these words came out of James and John's mouth. Well, I want us to look and see what God says about our mouth. In chapter 3 of James, the Bible says, my, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. But so many times our words do offend. He's a perfect man if he got control of his tongue and is also able to bridle the whole body. Behold, he says, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn them turn about their whole body. And also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, 
yet are they turned about with a very small helm, a little rudder, whithersoever the governor listeth, whichever way the captain wants to turn that ship, he can turn it with that little small rudder. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. It only takes a little old fire to burn a house down or a forest. And it only takes a few words to destroy a whole lot of things. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, and it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. That's where the fire comes from for every kind of beast of birds and serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no, no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. I'm going to stop right there on that. Folks, in this, in this text, here's Jesus, and he hears these words coming out of James and John's mouth, and they're thinking, you know what? we got a right to say this because God's done it before, and these people are the same sorry bunch that did it before, and now they're treating our Savior this way. They ought all just die. And Jesus turned and rebuked them, and he said, you know, not matter what spirit you're of, you don't. What is he saying? He's saying, you think that the Spirit of God has welled up in you and put these words to come out of your mouth. But it's your flesh that decided to say those words. You don't realize that you're talking like the devil back there. As hard as it is, and as much as I get sickened, folks, I get so sick when I see these, uh, the, 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 the sodomites who parade down the streets and they, they want to drag our children into it now. They want to make our children a part of their nasty, filthy perversion. When I see these, these women stand out in front of these abortion clinics and say, I'm proud to have an abortion. God bless abortion. They're doing that now. Standing out there, like I said last week, with a sign that said, if Mary had had an abortion, we wouldn't be in this mess. You know what? They all got to stand for God someday. And as much as my flesh, folks, as much as my flesh wants to go and stand in front of them all and tell them all they're going to burn in hell, because that's what my flesh wants to tell them, you're all doomed to hell. The truth of it is, they could get saved. They could get saved. I'm told, I, I don't know that it was a fact, but I'm told and told by pretty pretty good sources. You remember Jeffrey Dahmer? Remember this? Y'all remember the name Jeffrey? Y'all don't know who the name Jeffrey Dahmer is, do you? Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a man who who uh, he invited young homosexual men back to his house, and he'd kill them, and he'd cut them up, and he'd put them in his freezer, and he'd eat them later. Did a whole bunch of them that way. He grew up interested in taking animals apart, and when he got older, he changed over to people. He was a very, 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 very sick individual. But I'm told when he got to prison that Jeffrey Dahmer got saved. And he was killed in prison. Don't know why he was killed in prison. I don't remember exactly the details of it, but somebody killed him. If somebody like him can get saved, anybody can get saved. If German soldiers who were murdering Jews in, in concentration camps in World War II, if they can get saved, and some of them did after the war, by the way. I remember the story uh, of, of Corey Ten Boom talking about uh, meeting one of the soldiers who, who, had, uh, who had done so much harm to her and her sister. 
and this man coming up to her afterwards and asking her forgiveness. He had gotten saved. He'd asked her forgiveness. And she said it was the hardest thing for her to, to even think of doing is forgiving this man. And she didn't know she'd be able to do it. And then she said the love of God just flooded through her mind of how much Jesus had done for her and how much he'd forgiven her. And she said, my heart just melted and I forgave him. I, I, I mean, I've heard so many stories of people who were so cruel that they got saved. And, and folks, while part of me wants to, wants to just say, you know what, all those, all those sodomites that hate God and they mock him and everything else, they ought to just all burn in hell. But that's not my judgment. That's not me. That's not who I am. I should never stand in that judgment seat and say that they deserve anything because I deserved it. I deserve to burn in hell. I still deserve to burn in hell. I should burn in hell. But because of God and his love for me and the fact that he sacrificed his only son on my behalf, and because his blood has been applied to me and it's taken and completely washed my sins away and they're not there anymore, and I didn't deserve that. It's because of God's mercy. It's because of his unending grace that I have that salvation. And they can have it too. But you see, oh yeah, they're depraved. They're very depraved. But you see, God's got God's to show them. And my ugliness and my hatred will not show anybody. Let me turn one more place. All right. So now let's look down here at our text one more time. So Jesus said to him in verse 55, he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you're of. And he told him, he said, again, they didn't realize that they were they had allowed the devil to get a hold of them. Their flesh was the one driving this. And listen to what Jesus said. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives. Save them. That's the only reason he came that time, was to be the Savior. Oh, someday, someday, yes, at the end. Someday there's going to be a judgment seat. Yes, a great white throne judgment seat. There and there and, and finally there and there alone will that judgment be passed. And it'll be based on what they did with Jesus Christ. The Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And I turn over to John chapter 12, verse 44 and following. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but upon him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if a man hear my words and believe not, you hear me? If a man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. That's what Jesus said. I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and, reje- and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The word. The word of God is going to judge him. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. And he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Jesus is on his way to complete the mission. Jesus is saying, I'm not here to destroy anything. I'm not here to tear everything up that doesn't line up with me. I'm not here to kill anybody that doesn't agree with my word. I'm not even here to judge them. I'm here to die for them. I'm here to give them eternal life. We're not on a destruction mission. We're not on a, on a, on a, on a mission of, 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 of kill them all, let God sort them out. And folks, we're not either. I have run in the circles 
of, 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 of Baptist people, Baptist preachers who see themselves as vigilantes who are going to go out and are going to attack the, the works of Satan and destroy the works of Satan. Jesus Christ did not come on this earth to do that. And if Jesus Christ did not come upon this earth to destroy the works of Satan, but to preach the kingdom of God, that destroys the works of Satan. Not us. Not our feelings. Not our might. Not our thoughts. And we cannot go get God to come, to, to come break some skulls for us. And it's not our job. Look here. It's not our job to look at someone with prejudice and say they don't deserve the gospel. It's not our job to look at someone who is so grossly in, in, in ingrained in sin and say they don't deserve to hear the gospel because they're not clean enough for me to talk to. They're, they're too vile to hear it. No, Christ, Christ said they all got to hear it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. What am I trying to say? Jesus is the equal opportunity Savior. This world is full of, of sinners who are equally on their way to hell. And they all deserve to hear the gospel. No, I, I take that back. They all, all deserve to hear the gospel. None of us deserve to hear the gospel. But they all need to hear the gospel. Without hatred, without bullying, just an honest appeal. If they reject it, the Bible said very clearly the last words of their text this morning, and they went to another village. They didn't rain fire down on that one. They didn't go in and proclaim everyone lost for all eternity and, and, and doomed to hell. They just said, you know what? If you don't want it, we'll go somewhere else. What did Jesus say? If they don't receive you, burn their house down. No, shake the dust off your feet is a testimony against them. I don't want to do it the wrong way. I want to do it God's way. I want everybody listening to the sound of my voice to, to take these things into your heart and realize that we are to have the compassion of Christ. We are to do it as he did it. He is to do it through us. Again, we can't win anybody to Jesus. It has to be him in us convicting them and show it's his Holy Ghost who he left here with us to, to, to be his representative here on this earth to preach the message through us. So we're to carry it regardless of who they are, regardless of how they look, regardless of how they treat us, regardless of how they, 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 they look at us. It matters not. The message is that Christ saves sinners and sinners need to hear the gospel. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask you now, the best that I know how, take the word of God that's been preached and work in our hearts. Show us, Father, Lord, if our, if our attitude has been wrong. Lord, if we, if we have prejudice toward others because of their sin, Lord, I don't, I don't approve of it. I don't condone of the sin, Lord, that we've been describing this morning. But, Lord, I realize if they knew you, they wouldn't be in that sin. If they knew you, they'd, they'd feel the same way that I do about it. Lord, please help me to look past prejudices of this world to tell others of you, to tell others of what you'll do for them. Oh, Lord, I plead with you. Please do a work in my life. Make me, Lord, the kind of servant you want me to be. Father, forgive me for my, for my earthly ways, Lord, that have stood in the way at times. Father, I just plead with you to have mercy on me and forgive me. Bless us now as we leave from this place and go to our homes. Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd watch over us and take care of us through the week. Lord God, we thank you for the one who's visiting with us this morning. Pray, Lord, you just bless her and, and, and take care of her. Father, we just, we just thank you for visitors. And Lord God, we, we pray for each and every one that's listening to the sound of my voice, Lord. I pray, Father, for them, Lord, for someone out there who's on their way to hell. Father, they don't know how to be saved. Lord, I pray that, as the Bible says, 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We were born in it. We've lived in it and we'll die in it if, we're not, if we've not been saved. And the Bible, the Bible tells us that God commended or God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our sins were put on Jesus. Jesus died for our, for our sins on the cross, and he paid the price. He satisfied the wrath of an almighty God. And he was buried, and he didn't stay dead. He came out of the grave, signifying that God's, God's wrath was satisfied. And it's finished. It's over. It's done. And eternal life is a free gift for everyone who would believe. And I say to the sinner this morning, look and live. Look to Christ. Turn, bring your sin, lay it down at his feet and say, I want to believe and I want to be saved. He'll save you today. Oh, wayward child, turn around. There's forgiveness to be had. There's restoration to be sought. Turn around. Father, bless us now. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Amen.